The Fisherman's Friend restaurant is the only restaurant in Stonington, Maine. So, even though lobster prices reached a 40-year low in 2012, diners at the restaurant did not pay lower prices for their lobster meals. The Fisherman's Friend restaurant had a monopoly on selling seafood dinners in Stonington. They are price setters, and all consumers there are price takers. Barriers high enough to create monopoly can be due to 1. Government blocking the entry of more than one firm into a market. 2. One firm having control over a necessary resource. 3. The existence of network externalities in supplying the good or service. Or 4. Economies of scale so large that one firm has a natural monopoly. We have considered how markets form in response to many factors, but really it comes down to companies selling products that people want and need to buy. If the product is carrots, and just about anyone can grow them and loads of people want to buy them, then you have a perfectly competitive market like we saw in the farmer's markets. When loads of people want to buy the product, but there is some differentiation of product quality and price of the goods vendors sell, we have monopolistically competitive markets like we see with Starbucks Coffee or Upstate College. Monopoly markets structure comes in many flavors, including the power creation and distribution network of a country, landline telephone service, U.S. Postal Service, and even computer operating systems. We will look into these different flavors to understand how they influence our consumption habits. But first, we will sit in on a discussion with economist Milton Friedman in a lecture from the 1960s as he talked of monopolies. Mr. Friedman, how much government intervention do you think is necessary to prevent the rise of monopoly and oligopoly under the free enterprise system, or would it take care of itself? If left well, alone? I believe if you examine, uh, the, if you examine uh, the sources of monopoly and oligopoly, you will find that almost all those sources are government intervention. I think the situation is almost precisely the reverse. Let me put it in a very simple way. Suppose I were to ask this audience my favorite question along these lines. You have one law you can pass. Its only purpose is to reduce the extent of monopoly. That's its only purpose. You have one law. What law would be most effective in achieving that end? What law would you pass? <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean any gimmicks. You know, it's not going to be something in which you can have a law with 4,000 different parts. I'm not asking a very complicated question. What would you do? Limit the size of the market that they could. Well, have. that's one proposal. The limit is proposal. But you will agree with me, I'm sure, immediately that mine is a much better one. <laughs> and that's free trade. Eliminate all tariffs and all restrictions on foreign trade, and you enable the world to come in as competition to prevent domestic monopoly. Wouldn't that do a great deal more good in preventing monopoly? than would a limit on the size of enterprises with much less restriction in human freedom? Now, if you ask yourself, <laughs> ask yourself where do monopolies come from? In the United States, the most important and the strongest monopoly are unquestionably those that derive from governmental privilege. Uh, the monopoly of a TV license granted by the government at a zero price that's a source of monopoly privilege. It also has been a source of wealth for some notable Americans. <laughs> the, uh, grant of a, uh, the grant of a tariff protection. Would the steel industry in the United States have any kind of monopoly or oligopoly position if it weren't able to get the government to impose, uh, impose restrictions on imports of foreign items and so on? Uh, trade union monopolies. 
They get their strength and their support from Davis-Bacon Act, Walsh-Healy Act, other governmental measures that interfere with competition by others. It's very hard. In fact, I have tried to, I have tried to uh, consider, and George Stigler is a greater authority on this than I, so we, maybe we ought to get him in to uh, add to this, what private monopolies there are that have been able to maintain themselves over any long period of time without government assistance. And I have myself only been able to construct two. One is an international one, the De Beers Diamond Monopoly. It really is an extra, I don't understand it, maybe George can tell us the answer. But it has been successful over a very long period. And the second was a New York Stock Exchange. Not more recently, because since 1934 it's had the help of the SEC. But before 1934, from about the Civil War to 1934, so far as I know, it had no government support, and yet it did maintain an effective monopoly. But almost every other case, you have temporary monopolies develop, and if the government doesn't come in to shore them up, they fall to pieces. The railroads became a monopoly only because they were able to get the Interstate Commerce Commission established. Trucking is a monopoly because the ICC keeps out competitors. And you can go down the line and find that one hypothetical monopoly case after another derives from governmental assistance and support. So I think the answer to your question, and you and I have the same objective here, is less government intervention, not more. A monopoly is a firm that is the only seller of a good or service that does not have a close substitute. A narrow definition of monopoly is that a firm is a monopoly if it can ignore the actions of other firms. A broader definition of monopoly is that a firm is a monopoly if it can retain economic profits in the long run. Success is not the mother of monopoly. When a company creates something unique, valuable, and it becomes a component of another business's creativity and product development, we call that product a success. Google did it with their search engine. Then they built the service to make Gmail, OneDrive, YouTube, and other services like Google Translate. They did this without government assistance, and they own the market. Strictly, Google is not a monopoly, but because of their market power, they can perform as if they are. It is not so dissimilar to Microsoft in its market position for software. A monopoly requires that barriers to entry into the market must be so high that no other firms can enter. There are four barriers high enough to keep out competing firms. One, a government blocks the entry of more than one firm into the market. Two, one firm has control over a key resource necessary to produce a good. Three, there are important network externalities in supplying the good or service. And four, economies of scale are so large that one firm has a natural monopoly. Although governments ordinarily try to promote competition, sometimes they take action to block entry into a market. The U.S. government blocks entry by granting a patent or copyright that gives an individual or firm the exclusive right to produce a product, and by granting a firm product franchise, making it the exclusive legal provider of a good or service. A patent is the exclusive right to a product for a period of 20 years from the date the patent is filed with the government. Patents encourage firms to spend money on research and development necessary to produce new products. Books, films, and software can receive copyright protection. A copyright is a government-granted exclusive right to produce and sell a creation. The right is granted for the creator's lifetime, and his or her heirs retain this exclusive right for 70 years after the creator's death. 
A public franchise is a government designation that a firm is the only legal provider of a good or service. You cannot hope to become a monopolist of all board games. But you can claim trademark to a unique name, like the game Monopoly. Other firms can make board games with their own rules, but they cannot use the name Monopoly because of the registered trademark or the matching emblems and rules. Did the U.S. government create a board game Monopoly? Sure it did. The same way it does this for all intellectual property protection enabled through our enforcement of property rights. Controlling a key resource happens infrequently. Examples include the Aluminum Company of America, which until the 1940s had long-term contracts to buy nearly all available bauxite. Another example is the International Nickel Company of Canada. Unique access to key resources makes monopolies possible. Exclusive access can come in the form of collective bargaining granted by shrewd negotiations by organizations like the NFL. Laws are not in place to make them the only authorized league. In fact, the AFL made a run as a competitor but could not compete for players. That was their barrier to entry. Earth minerals and river water are in the ownership of the government and they enable extraction under their terms of use. What about the sun? No authority to license it? Is that why we have not deployed solar panels to every home in the country? <laughs> De Beers of South Africa acted on a national endowment of diamond mines possessing extremely high quality and large size diamonds. They negotiated exclusive rights to mine and market the gems and build a global market strategy. Then, diamond mining was expanded in other countries, and competitors eroded De Beers market dominance. With 40% of the world diamond market remaining, De Beers initiated a forever mark brand on their stones. Think about that one for a minute. Is your purchase of a diamond based on the name of the jeweler? I would even take it another step to ask if the size of the stone is as important as the intent of the jewelry. Of course, I am thinking about it in terms of the biggest market in North America for diamonds. Wedding rings, earrings, brooches and necklaces. Would the wearer want to disassemble the arrangement to verify its origin? On the other hand, if the buyer treats the diamond as an investment, the brand may serve that purpose, at least as long as counterfeiters do not figure out how to replicate the brand. Network externalities refer to a situation in which the usefulness of a product increases with the number of consumers who use it. Some economists argue that network externalities can serve as barriers to entry but there is considerable debate about the extent to which they serve as barriers. This comes to play in terms of Microsoft making and selling software like Office. They hold dominant market share for this software in the Windows and Macintosh operating systems. We know Microsoft gives MS Office software for free to college students and that companies around the world purchase the software from the corporation to make it a $407 billion company as of 2016. But there are software competitors making MS Office-like products. OpenOffice.org makes a GNU-licensed software solution of Office-like bundle operating much like MS Office software from about five years ago. The OpenOffice.org software is free and operates on Windows, Mac, and Linux operating systems. 
The network externality kicks in because consumers are familiar with MS Office and stick with it. Hmm, I understand why Microsoft gives it for free to college students. A natural monopoly is a situation in which economies of scale are so large that one firm can supply the entire market at lower average total cost than can two or more firms. In this case, there is room for only one firm. Natural monopolies are likely to occur in markets where fixed costs are very large relative to variable costs. With a natural monopoly, the average total cost curve is still falling when it crosses the demand curve, point A. If only one firm is producing electric power in the market, and it produces where the average total cost curve intersects the demand curve, average total cost will equal 4 cents per kilowatt hour of electricity produced. If the market is divided between two firms, each producing 15 billion kilowatt hours, the average cost of producing electricity rises to 6 cents per kilowatt hour, point B. In this case, if one firm expands production, it can move down the average total cost curve, lowering its price, and drive the other firm out of business. We take a look into power production and distribution in Kenya, where the national government owns the rights to charge for power and decides who receives connections. Currently, despite high prices paid by consumers, about 85% of Kenyans are not connected to the national power grid. Start on Matters Energy. A Kenyan legislator has filed a motion seeking to end the monopoly of the country's sole and state owned electricity distributor and transmission company, Kenya Power, on grounds of inefficiency. The legislator, David Bowen, argues that a lack of competition in the sector has contributed to poor services and high tariffs charged by the company in a country that is set out, that has set out rather, to attain middle income status over the next 16 years. High electricity charges are among factors that contribute to Kenya's high cost of doing business. The motion also seeks to have Kenya Power compelled to compensate those who have been negatively affected by erratic power supply. 85% of Kenyans are still not connected to the national grid and liberalizing the sector as a whole is seen as one way of getting them connected faster by leveraging private investment. <laughs> Like other firms, a monopoly maximizes profit by producing where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. But unlike other firms, the monopolistic industry's demand curve is the demand curve for the company. Remember the monopolistic competition industry has profits in the short run, but the entry of competitors will vacate profits in the long run. Barriers to entry creating the monopoly prevents the evacuation of profits in the long run. Profits remain without competition. Now it resides on the selectivity of consumers to participate in the market for that product. Time Warner Cable faces a downward sloping demand curve for subscriptions to basic cable. To sell more subscriptions, it must cut the price. When this happens, it gains revenue from selling more subscriptions but loses revenue from selling at a lower price the subscriptions that it could have sold at a higher price. The firm's marginal revenue is the change in revenue from selling another subscription. We can calculate marginal revenue by subtracting the revenue lost as a result of the price cut from the revenue gained. The table shows that Time Warner's marginal revenue is less than the price for every subscription sold after the first subscription. Therefore, Time Warner's marginal revenue curve will be below its demand curve. Like other firms, a monopoly maximizes profit by producing where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. But unlike other firms, the monopoly's demand curve is the same as the demand curve for the product. Bam! We are right back to the monopoly game sign with Mr. Clifford. As we will see again, 
the marginal revenue curve is steeper than the demand curve. The slope of the marginal revenue curve decides the effect price will have on quantity demanded. Panel A shows that to maximize profit, Time Warner should sell subscriptions up to the point where the marginal revenue from selling the last subscription equals its marginal cost, point A. In this case, both the marginal revenue from selling the sixth subscription and the marginal cost are $27. Time Warner maximizes profit by selling six subscriptions per month and charging a price of $42, point B. Putting a wrapper around these topics, start by considering the average total cost curve in panel B. I would consider this firm a low-cost provider of the product they sell. I call them this way because the ATC curve is only slightly above the intersection of marginal revenue and marginal cost. The barrier to entry may be in the form of government restrictions, control over a key resource, or even a natural monopoly situation. Remember how we determine price to charge as the intersection at point A to discover the quantity drawn up to point B to the price at this intersection with the demand curve. Total revenue is bounded by the axes to point B. Profits here are bounded by the quantity line at 6 units times the price between the price at point B and the intersection of the ATC curve, the green shaded box. The blue box, showing the area above price and below the demand curve, shows consumer surplus enjoyed by buyers of the commodity. Another interesting interaction here is to identify the area in panel A where the marginal revenue price is greater than zero and realize it shows the elastic range of demand. Where marginal revenue price is below zero, we have the inelastic range of demand. You might also call that point of marginal revenue intersection with the x-axis at the perfectly elastic point of production. Based on this sample monopolies example, it operates within the elastic realm of production. That means increases in price will increase total revenue for the manufacturer. Socially optimal production levels are entertained with the resources under control of the government, like river water dammed up for hydroelectric power, or railroad transportation fees on lines built and maintained by the government. The intersection of marginal cost with the demand curve represents the quantity and price at this socially optimal quantity and price. Deadweight loss is seen from the intersection of marginal cost and demand diagonally to points A and B when the monopoly price is set to the level for point B. This is the loss to the economy for the transactions that never takes place, the deadweight loss. On the other hand, if the socially optimal quantity and price are set, the consumer surplus will eclipse the area above price and below the demand curve. Some products in the monopolistic market structure arrangement face a situation of a price ceiling. In this case, the monopoly producer will face a not-to-exceed order based on the ceiling created by marginal cost intersecting demand. Another point of significance for this graph is where average total cost curve intersects the demand curve. This identifies the point of no economic profit for the manufacturing company. This also identifies the level of profits this firm will experience even with the socially optimal quantity and price. Circling back one more time, consider the monopolist identifying point A to determine point B and the price to charge. Now, what happens when marginal costs increase? Maybe it is a tax imposed by the government with authority 
and these costs must be transferred to consumers. The new intersection of marginal revenue and marginal cost increases price and reduces quantity. Note that demand does not change and marginal revenue does not change. It is only the marginal cost structure that is modified. Though a monopolist can earn economic profits, new firms will not enter the monopolist's market. The firm can earn economic profits even in the long run. In some cases, this has the unintended consequence of a reduction in innovation for the firm. The incentive to invest and create is reduced because there are no competitors pushing the envelope for competition. A monopoly will produce less and charge a higher price than would a perfectly competitive industry producing the same good. Make a mental journey to consider monopolistically competitive markets and monopolies and think about artificially created monopolies for good you use, like a smartphone. What would happen to price and quantity, the quality of the product you buy, and the evolution of your phone's service. In panel A, the market for smartphones is perfectly competitive, and price and quantity are determined by the intersection of demand and supply curves. In panel B, the perfectly competitive smartphone market becomes a monopoly. As a result, 1. The industry's supply curve becomes the monopolist's marginal cost curve. The monopolist reduces output to where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, QM. 3. The monopolist raises the price from PC to PM. This is the serious comparison of these two market structures for the same product. In perfect competition, we had no marginal revenue curve to set price and quantity with. We use only supply intersection with demand. Monopoly gives the marginal revenue curve to consider, and that changes the game. Because a monopoly raises the market price, it reduces consumer surplus. The increase in price due to monopoly increases producer surplus compared with perfect competition. By increasing price and reducing the quantity produced, the monopolist reduces economic surplus. The reduction in economic surplus is a deadweight loss and represents a loss of economic efficiency due to monopoly. In contrast to perfect competition, the monopolist charges a price that is greater than its marginal cost. A monopoly charges a higher price, price market or PM and produces a smaller quantity, quantity market, or QM, than a perfectly competitive industry, which charges price PC and produces QC. The higher price reduces consumer surplus by the area equal to the rectangle A and the triangle B. Some of the reduction in consumer surplus is captured by the monopoly as producer surplus, and some becomes deadweight loss, which is the area equal to triangles B and C. The area above price PC and below demand curve is part of the perfectly competitive market's consumer surplus. In the monopoly, this is transferred partially to the producer, rectangle A. The migration of this surplus still retains the surplus for the economy, but triangles B and C are the deadweight loss for the transactions that never take place. That is an economic loss brought on by the monopoly. Because there are few monopolies, the loss of economic efficiency from monopoly is small. But many firms have market power. The ability of a firm to charge a price greater than marginal cost the only firms that have no market power are firms in perfectly competitive markets. Because few markets are perfectly competitive, 
some loss of economic efficiency occurs in the market for nearly every good or service. Arnold Harberger and other economists have confirmed that the total loss of economic efficiency in the U.S. economy from market power is small. According to Harberger, if every industry in the United States were perfectly competitive, the gain in economic efficiency would equal less than 1% of the value of total production. Joseph Schumpeter is closely associated with the argument that the economy may benefit from firms that have market power. Schumpeter argued that economic progress is dependent on technological change in the form of new products. Those who support Schumpeter's view argue that the introduction of new products requires expenditures on research and development, and firms with market power that can fund research are more likely to earn economic profits than perfectly competitive firms. Others disagree with Schumpeter's views and point out that small firms develop many new products. One role we usually associate with government intervention or government activity is the regulation of monopolies. And we think of, uh, we think of legislation like the Sherman Antitrust Act as a way that we control the growth of monopoly market power and the ability of firms to come to dominate one industry. And the, the history of this kind of regulation teaches us a lot about the, the economic processes that drive uh, innovation and economic activity and whether or not uh, regulation in these natural monopoly situations actually provides value and makes consumers better off. Take for example the electricity industry. By the 1890s it's really starting to grow especially in large cities like New York and Chicago. Initially they were very rivalrous. A lot of firms entered the market to provide electric service in larger cities and competed against each other. Uh, the kinds of innovations that happened in this industry were of big scale. Large generators, lots of long wires uh, connecting large generators in places like Niagara Falls to cities like New York. And that changed the cost structure of the industry. It changed the cost structure of the industry in a way that the electric company that owned this generator, their fixed cost was very, very high for building these big generators, but then their cost for s serving an additional customer was really, really, really low. And so that meant that their average cost per unit of electricity they sold and their average cost per customer really fell and fell over the course of serving a large number of customers. And in economics, we call this economies of scale. And this economies of scale in the big technologies and in industries like electricity really make it challenging to have rivalrous competition. So in Chicago, for example, in the late 1890s, there were about a dozen different firms providing electric service in the Chicago market. But as they competed against each other, they competed so much that they were lowering their prices, lowering their prices, lowering their prices until price would go so low that they couldn't actually pay all of the fixed costs that they had incurred to build the generators in the first place. And not all of the companies could stay in the market. And that process, over time, led to the consolidation of the electricity industry in cities like New York and Chicago into one large firm. And that firm could, as a monopoly in that market, charge a high price to consumers. And that was very much a part of the, the kind of public interest motivation of regulation. The, this progressive era, suspicion of large corporate activity, suspicion of large companies, 
and also the progressive era belief in the ability of government regulation to stand in for competition and correct the imperfections that they saw. There's also a more kind of public choice motivation looking at the incentives and the interests of both policymakers and the industry. They have an incentive to embrace regulation because regulation constructs a legal entry barrier and says in a particular geographic territory, you will be the only firm allowed to provide retail electricity service to the people living in this area. And no one else is allowed to do that. In return for government protection of your monopoly power, we will regulate the profits that you earn on your assets and in that process regulate the prices you can charge to consumers. And we're going to shoot for trying to keep those prices at around average cost per unit of output to try to keep prices as low as are sustainable in the long run, but still consistent with the firm investing in assets and earning a return on their assets. And so that's the regulatory compromise. And, uh, and that's one reason why industry actually embraced regulation in electricity. One of the presumptions on which regulation is built in this industry is one of, of sort of stability, that we have a static environment. Right? And so, you know, this is the cost structure in this industry, boom. This is what kind of assets firms are going to build, boom. And so we can figure all that out and back out what the right profits are and what the right prices are. Uh, the information required to get that right is, I would argue, unknowable. You know, they just think, okay, here's this demand for electricity, and we have to meet this demand. But now, especially with air conditioning, uh, we see demand fluctuating dramatically over the course of the day. And yet we pay this fixed averaged retail price that gives us as individual consumers no incentive to change our consumption even at 5 o'clock when it's 95 degrees out on an August afternoon. I would argue that, that today, here, you know, here we are in early in the 21st century, that now is when we're really seeing the cost of regulation in terms of how it stifles innovation. Uh, I attribute this to a misunderstanding in the late 19th and early 20th century about what competitive processes actually entail and what drives them and what they create. And that's where we are now, is trying to deal with the fact that the regulatory system of the past century uh, doesn't address, you know, hasn't adapted to, hasn't evolved along with the ways we use electricity um, the new ways we may generate electricity, including renewables, it, it hasn't evolved to take into account the growth of digital technologies that we can use to, you know, basically program and monitor our own electricity use and respond automatically to price changes. And so I think that's where we are now, is on the brink of, of recognizing the costs of regulation. We've focused for so long on the benefits to consumers of having these low, stable, fixed prices and universal service. But now these low, stable, fixed prices are leading to a lot of electricity consumption in peak hours when it's really expensive to provide it for us, and also the environmental concerns. You know, it's generating a lot of emissions in the process. And so those are the 21st century challenges. Most governments have policies that regulate the behavior of monopolies. U.S. antitrust laws make illegal any attempts to form a monopoly or to collude. Collusion is an agreement among firms to charge the same price or otherwise not to compete. Governments also regulate firms that are natural monopolies.
The first important law regulating monopolies in the United States was the Sherman Act in 1890, which was designed to promote competition and prevent the formation of monopolies. The Sherman Act targeted firms that had combined to form trusts. Trusts enabled firms to collude. Trusts disappeared after the Sherman Act was passed, but the term antitrust laws continue to be used to refer to laws aimed at eliminating collusion and promoting competition among firms. To address loopholes in the Sherman Act, Congress passed the Clayton Act and the Federal Trade Commission Act in 1914. Under the Clayton Act, a merger was illegal if its effect was substantially to lessen competition or to tend to create a monopoly. The Federal Trade Commission Act established the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, which was given power to police unfair business practices. Congress divided the authority to police mergers between the FTC and the Antitrust Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. Apple iPad was a new and innovative product to sell consumers books on tablet-like devices. Their pricing strategy was suspiciously like a price-fixing solution involving Apple and five of the largest book publishers who colluded to set e-book prices above competitive price standards. The Department of Justice won the case against Apple. The federal government regulates mergers because if firms gain market power by merging, they may use this power to raise prices and reduce output. The government is most concerned with horizontal mergers. A horizontal merger is a merger between firms in the same industry. A vertical merger is a merger between firms at different stages of production of a good. Two factors complicate regulating horizontal mergers. First, the market that firms are in is not always clear. Second, there is a possibility that the newly merged firm might be more efficient than the merging firms were individually. This figure shows the results of all the firms in a perfectly competitive industry merging to form a monopoly. If the merger does not affect costs, the result is price rises from PC to BM, quantity falls from QC to QM, consumer surplus declines, and a loss of economic efficiency results. If, however, the monopoly has lower costs than the perfectly competitive firms, as shown by the marginal cost curve shifting to MC after the merger, it is possible that the price of the good will actually decline from PC to P merge, and that output will increase from QC to Q merge following the merger. If they all happened like this, mergers would be encouraged. But this is a best case scenario. In 1973, the Economics Section of the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice was established and staffed with economists who were entrusted with evaluating the economic consequences of proposed mergers. In 1982, the Department of Justice and the FTC developed merger guidelines that made it easier for firms considering a merger to understand whether the government would allow the merger. The guidelines have three main parts. 1. Market Definition A market consists of all firms making products that consumers view as close substitutes. This definition of the market is extremely important. For this candy example, consider if you are talking about candy, snacks, or all food. The broader the market, the less of an effect is the merger. 2. The merger of market concentration. 
A merger between firms in a market that is already highly concentrated is likely to increase market power. The guidelines use the Herfindahl Hirschman Index, HHI, of concentration, which squares the market shares of each firm in the industry and adds up the values of the squares. This incorporates the expanse of a market across areas, states, regions, and the entire nation. A merger might represent a significant potential effect on a city, but if the firms are spread around the entire nation and their co-location is not uniform in each community, the market shares before and after merger may be comparatively low. Also consider if the products the companies make are sold only within the local production area, or if the product is sold nationally and internationally. And 3. Merger Standards The Department of Justice and the FTC use the HHI calculations to evaluate proposed horizontal mergers. The measurement criteria receiving acute attention pivots on if the merger would result in substantial efficiency gains. If it does, then both price would decrease and quantities supplied would increase. By now, you know I have a history working in natural resources, specifically in forestry. In February 2016, one of the largest vertically integrated timber products companies in North America, Warehouser, made a move to merge with Plum Creek Timber, another mega timber products firm in North America. On the face of it, the vertical merger of these two companies would catch the attention of both the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission. How would the herfindahl hirschman Index calculate the effects of this merger? I'm Sarah Hashimoris for Smart Trend News. One of the top U.S. forest products companies, Warehouser operates along several business lines, including wood products like lumber, plywood, and other building materials, and cellulose fibers or pulp products. Also, its Timberlands division manages some 6 million acres of company-owned U.S. timberland and more than 15 million acres of leased Canadian timberland. Its real estate unit develops housing and mastered plan communities. Warehouse has incorporated in 1900, and it now operates offices in 10 countries and serves customers worldwide. I'm Sarah Hashimaris for Smart Trend News. For more company profiles, visit our website, tradethetrend.com, or subscribe to our YouTube channel, Trade the Trend. I'm Christy Duffy for Smart Trend News. Real estate and investment trust Plum Creek Timber is one of the United States' largest timber companies with more than 7 million acres of timberland in 19 states. Harvesting old and new growth timber, the company sells logs to sawmills and pulp and paper mills. It also produces lumber, plywood, and medium-density fiberboard. It also has real estate sales operations and pursues natural resource opportunities, including mineral extraction and natural gas production. In an effort to promote environmental conservation, Plum Creek announced plans to sell some 310,000 acres of land to environmental groups in 2008. I'm Christy Duffy for Smart Trend News. For more on Plum, Plum Creek Timber, visit our website, tradethetrend.com. Shareholders of both companies approved the merger at separate special meetings of shareholders held on February 12, 2016. The combined company retains the Warehouser name and continues to be traded under the WY ticker symbol on the New York Stock Exchange. The combined company owns more than 13 million acres of diverse and productive timberlands and operates 38 wood products manufacturing facilities across the country. Both Warehouser and Plum Creek were vertically integrated companies who own timberlands, harvest their own timber and hire logging contractors, mill their timber products into lumber, plywood, oriented strand board, particle board, pulp and paper. Warehouser even initiated a sector of their business as a construction company 
to build homes using lumber from their mills. Doyle Simmons, president and CEO of Warehouser, said, This is an exciting day for Warehouser as we bring together the best assets and talent in the industry. In the coming months, we will be relentlessly focused on creating value for our shareholders by capturing cost synergies, leveraging our scale, sharing best practices, delivering the most value from every acre, and driving operational excellence. I look forward to being part of this outstanding team as we work together to be the world's premier timber, land, and forest products company. Across the nation, Warehouser and Plum Creek forest lands and mills were the strongholds of the industry. But timber is purchased and milled at regional locations, like Clearwater Paper in Lewiston, Idaho, at Forest Products Group in Grangeville, Idaho, Warehouser Lumber in Longview, Washington, and hundreds of other locations around the forested areas of the country. Rarely were Warehouser and Plum Creek Mills co-located in the same communities, so their merger did not have a direct change to competition in individual markets for timber. Where they did, other timber buyers balanced the competitive influences on individual markets. Both companies sold lumber on the world market in a compilation of competitive challengers. If the merger was considered on the national scale, the post-merger HHI would potentially arrive between 1500 and 2500. In this case, the change in the HHI comes in at less than 100, and the challenge was not made. If a firm is a natural monopoly, competition will not play its role of forcing prices down to the level where the company earns zero economic profit. Local and state regulatory commissions usually set prices for natural monopolies. To achieve economic efficiency, regulators should require that the monopoly charge a price equal to its marginal cost. But this strategy has a drawback when the firm's average total cost curve is still falling when it crosses the demand curve. If the firm charges a price equal to marginal cost, price will be less than average total cost, and the firm will suffer an economic loss. Most regulators will set the price equal to the level of average total cost so that the firm can at least break even. A natural monopoly that is not subject to government regulation will charge a price equal to PM and produce QM. If government regulators want to achieve economic efficiency, they will set the regulated price equal to PE and the monopoly will produce QE. Unfortunately, PE is below average total cost and the monopoly will suffer a loss. Because the monopoly will not continue to produce in the long run if it suffers a loss, government regulators set a price equal to average total cost, which is PR in this figure. The resulting production, QR, will be below the efficient level, but the firm will be able to produce in the long run. Regulatory commissions often recruit their members from the companies they regulate. Although these individuals are knowledgeable about the regulated firm, they may be biased toward the firm's positions rather than the consumers whose interests they are supposed to represent. Other regulators may be biased against the firms they regulate. It is difficult to select commission members who are both knowledgeable and unbiased. Another problem is that allowing a firm to only break even rather than earn an economic profit may give it less incentive to reduce its costs than if it were unregulated. The firm would not earn higher profits from any cost-cutting actions, and the commission would be willing to allow a price increase if higher average total costs could be documented. <laughs>